by our relationship with candidates. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Welcome to today's forum. First of all, um, no, I've never been a president. Um, but the, the biggest news is at 3.42 this morning, I became a grandma again. First grandson. First grandson. Um, today, here at the forum, we are hearing from zones 1, 2, 4, and 5 in the Beaverton School District. Last week, we heard from the Dwellton Valley Water District candidates and those candidates for Beaverton School District Zone 7. Thank you very much. I didn't write that down. We had three candidates, so they spoke last week. Today, the format will be, we will, each zone, um, only one is uncontested, so we will have the, the candidates for Zone 1 come up, and each has no more than, no more than five minutes. And see, John um, McWilliams over there has little pieces of paper. He will give you a one minute and 30, or 30 second warning. You will not go over five minutes. I can be obnoxious. I'm a mom, I'm a grandma. Um, after all the candidates have done their presentations, telling, about, telling us about who they are, their background, and why they want to do this unpaid many hour position, uh, we will have questions and answers from forum members only, and all responses from the candidates will be no more than one minute, because I'm suspecting that when there is a question asked, it will be to the group at large, and you each have an opportunity to respond. If a question is to a particular candidate, please allow that candidate um, only to answer the question. With that, we will start with Zone 1, and um, I'm going to go in alphabetical order in every case. So Jay Bengal uh, is candidate for Zone 1, and he will speak for his five minutes or less, or less. Also, if anybody wants to know, just so that everyone understands this, while we are having four different zones speak today, Zones 1, 2, 4, and 5, as members, as residents in the Beaverton School District, voters in the district, we vote for each zone. The only difference is, is that in this case, zone one, uh, candidates have to live within the boundaries of zone one. We don't have a, um, anything to throw up on the screen. I did do one this morning just so that I could remember where everybody was. Um, and anybody can look at it if they want to. It's on the Beaverton School District website. So with that, let's welcome Jay Bengal to tell us all about Jay. It's amazing how dry your mouth gets just before you're getting ready to speak. My name is Jay Bengal. Thank you. I am running for Beaverton School District School Board Director, Zone 1, and I'd like to, like to thank you all for having me here today to speak. I am the father of a current Beaverton School District student at Whitford Middle School and a 2012 graduate of Beaverton High School who is now at the University of Oregon. My wife Mary is a 25-year educator of the state of Oregon and is currently assigned to Beaverton High School. I have owned the same home in Zone 1 in Beaverton for the last 29 years. I'm employed by Pacific Coast Fruit Company as a transportation logistics specialist. That means I'm in charge of 70 trucks and drivers, making sure that everybody's product gets where it needs to be on time. As a matter of fact, one pulled up here when I was sitting out in my car, so check him off the list. I have uh, 20 years experience in uh, public school operations. I was at Portland Public Schools from 1982 to 2001. Uh, was maintenance, materials, logistics, nutrition services, information technology, educational media, and library technical services. I lived through the good times and the bad times at Beaverton, or at, excuse me, at Portland School District. I was so grateful during those bad times that I lived on the side of the fence that was Beaverton School District because literally that is our fence. The other side is Portland School District. Although I worked in Portland, because of the reputation Beaverton had, I was, I was very happy that the kids were going to go to that school district. 
At the end of her career in Beaverton, my daughter rode the leading edge of the times we were in. She received a model education, one we want for all of our children. My son is in eighth grade at Whitford and is wholeheartedly feeling the effects of the situation we're in now. Overcrowding, limited resources, and missing opportunities that were available only a year ago. I see his grades dropping and his attachment to school dwindling. Both stories of my children are part of why I'm running for Beaverton School Board. I myself received a quality public education in Oregon. I had every opportunity available to me. My parents were both educators in Oregon, moving from classroom teaching to administrative positions. My dad managing federal grant money for Portland Public Schools and my mom being director of special services for Tiger Tualatin School District. I have a deep-seated desire to see the future of education preserved and to not lose any more ground locally or on a statewide basis. My focus as a school board member will be reduced class size, bringing back manageable class size for classroom teachers, eliminating the overwhelming current scenario of too many students with too few classroom resources to keep the students engaged. If the teachers are showing signs of over overload, fatigue, and the difficulty of teaching itself, this is picked up by the students and they begin to show the same emotion. Kids are very smart. They can see a teacher who is overwhelmed, and once they are disengaged from that teacher, it is very hard to win them back if the situation is not fixed. Classroom teachers and students both deserve every opportunity to accomplish the process of education. A well-rounded, comprehensive education available for every student. We all remember the adage, you can't fit a square peg into a round hole, meaning you can't make something or someone be what it is not. Limiting the scope of education by cutting what seems to some to be expendable areas is just that. Physical education, music, and the arts are invaluable assets in a whole child educational plan. These are the catalysts in the learning process and give dimension to a child's development and education. School safety and anti-bullying. Although school safety and anti-bullying are separate topics, they share ties with each other that are relevant to the overcrowding of classrooms and the understaffing of facilities. Reviewing and updating district policy, as well as maintaining a uniform and consistent procedure throughout the school district is of great importance. The policy of bullying, harassment, hazing, etc., is one that needs to have consistency, consequences, and follow through to maintain a zero tolerance posture throughout the school district. Schools should be a welcoming, nurturing place of learning. No child should have the feeling of fear, intimidation, or physical harm to detract them from every opportunity for an education. My endorsements for Beaverton School District School Board come from Bill Gander, owner of Standard TV and Appliance, Dave Namarnik, president of Pacific Coast Fruit Company, Lisa Schultz, former Beaverton School Board Director, Macy Mackey, owner of Beaverton Dairy Queen, Fred Sauter, Oregon Symphony retired, Brad, Brad Townsend, Director of Athletic Bands, Oregon State University, and Russ Schmidt, President of Beaverton Music Services. Thank you. Next, Susan Greenberg. School Board Zone 1. We have two children in the school district ages 16 and 10. Our son Seth goes to the International School of Beaverton as a sophomore and our daughter Zoe is in fourth grade at Montclair Elementary School. Uh, my daughter Zoe is actually um, because of the budget cuts in a she's a fourth grader who's in a fifth grade class. She's one of seven fourth graders in this fifth grade class so she's getting fifth grade curriculum this year and um, probably will be getting a repeat of fifth grade curriculum next year. Like many of you, I volunteered for years in my children's schools, in the classroom, at fundraisers, on field trips, 
twice I was PTO president of Montclair Elementary School and I'm currently president of the parent organization at the International School of Beaverton. Our PTO boards were able to put tools in the hands of our teachers that they would not otherwise have had. I'm active in the community, including serving on many community boards. In these leadership roles, I've always brought consensus, community building, and the ability to bring people together to make things happen for our schools and students. At ISB, I've worked on our committee to bring cultural events to the students. This cultural enrichment would not happen without parent involvement. Verna Bailey, principal at Montclair, has spoken about her experiences in the civil rights movement, which has truly impacted students at ISB. Many children in Beaverton have strong family support and can compensate for the loss of programs with music lessons and tutoring, but I've seen far too many kids whose families do not have the resources to get what they need. I will make sure our most vulnerable students aren't getting left behind, which is unjust and hurts our whole community. No one person can do this alone. The school board, administrators, teachers, parents, and students all need to work together. All must be open to new ways of doing things if we are to move forward. Having a great school system is not just about money. It's about being smart, accountable, innovative, and using the resources we do have in new and creative ways. It's about taking advantage of new approaches and new technologies. I'm asking for your vote and your support to make this happen. I'm currently on the school district's budget committee, which in the last two years has been extremely challenging. I understand the budgeting process and the difficult decisions that have been made. Not that I'm happy about the decisions. For our students to be successful, we need to have smaller class sizes, arts offered at every level to everyone, and more innovation in the schools. Financially, this means the state needs to budget education at a level 6.75 billion or more, and the local levy option needs to be passed. I'm knocking on doors with other volunteers to get the word out about how important it is to get the levy passed. I want what other, every other family in this district wants and should demand, the best possible education for our children. I fought for kids for the past nine years and I'll fight for more funding. I will work with you to make sure parents and students' voices are heard in the district decisions. I've watched the Beaverton School District go from a great school district to a district struggling to just deliver the basics for our kids. Cuts to music, library, physical education leave our children short the opportunities that were available just a few years ago. If elected, increasing the district funding, encouraging innovation, and restoring the quality of Beaverton schools will be a top priority. Thank you. Next, we have zone two, and that is Anne Bryan. I want to thank the forum for the opportunity to uh, introduce myself to you a bit today. Uh, I was fortunate to come to Oregon about 20 years ago with my husband, John, before uh, moving here. Uh, if you listen to me for a little while, you might be able to pick up that I was raised in New Jersey, um, especially if I get into a somewhat heated discussion, it will uh, become quickly apparent. Um, with that background, I grew very accustomed to having a very full and rich school environment. My husband, surprisingly, hails from Newark, California. Um, he grew up in an environment where resources were very limited. So when our children come home and talk about what happened to them at school, he says things like, really? You have a PE teacher? And I, and I say things like, well, why is there no art teacher? <laughs> so um, within our home, we understand that uh, schools have to make tough choices. We are grateful to be the parents of four sons who attend Beaverton High School, or Beaverton schools right now. Uh, our oldest two sons are at Westview High School. I have a middle schooler in the Meadow Park program um, at Meadow Park uh, Middle School, and I have a fourth grader at Oak Hills Elementary. Uh, 
While they have been in school, I've had many opportunities to work as a volunteer, uh, often in a role as a treasurer. Um, currently, I am a treasurer for the Westview Band Parents Group, um, and also I am the president of Meadow Park PTO right now. Uh, prior to becoming a professional volunteer, as my mother likes to call it, um, I was a project manager for IBM and uh, helped with a small startup company. There are three things that uh, have informed my campaign and my uh, motivation to run for uh, Beaverton School Board. The first comes from a conversation that I had with my fourth grader last October. At dinner one night, he said, Mom, when are budget cuts going to end? And I thought, oh, well, first of all, I don't think for a really long time, but tell me more about that. What's happening here? What don't you like? And in my mind, I'm thinking, that's probably the 35 kids in his class. But that wasn't it. It was that he was having technology class without a teacher, and that he was having library class without a teacher, that he was having extra specials, um, which were also without teachers. He wanted to have teachers back in his classroom. Um, as an adult, I could look at what he was frustrated by and know that the thing that is lacking in our school district right now is the solid financial foundation to make those things that are frustrating him a reality. My number one priority is to make sure that we have a budget situation that allows him to have teachers be in his class and that he'll know next year that he'll have those teachers in the class as well. Um, as part of that frustration that I feel around the community, I, um, I feel like we also need to have really clear communication with everyone about the choices that we're being forced to make so that we can all collectively get behind those choices and support them. I've spoken with too many people who say, well, you know, this was the best we could do, or we didn't really understand it was going to be that bad. Everyone in our community should understand the trade-offs and the choices that we're making so that collectively we can get behind that and tell our friends and neighbors proudly, we understand those were some tough choices and this is why we made them. Clear communication is so important to me and something that I will work behind. The last um, thing that I really feel like I can bring to the school board is engagement for all students. One of the opportunities that I have, and that um, oddly I cherish, is I'm able to work one-on-one -on -one with middle school, middle school students once a week. As part of this opportunity, um, earlier this year, I had an opportunity to um, go over and just check to see where the kids were on their homework to make sure that they were doing the things. This was the thing the teacher asked me to do. And so I was talking to one of the students, who is a child who I happen to have known for the last seven years. And uh, I noticed that in the middle of his homework, there was one problem that he hadn't done. And I said, how come you didn't do this problem? What's up with that? And he said, well, I didn't understand it. And I said, oh, well, well let me help you understand the question so you could do it and get the O. And he said, can't I just take the S? And I thought, I do not want to be part of a school system where we are encouraging students to have an attitude that they can just take the S. We need to have engaging learning opportunities so that they know that we expect the most out of them and that we will support them in achieving that. As a candidate, I've been asked a few times, do you think you can help? Why are you doing this? And I always say with somewhat of a mixture of hope that I do think that I can make a difference. I'm willing to give it a shot and I'm gonna work hard. And if I can't, I don't think I will be doing this again because we all have other things to do. But I am hopeful that with a solid foundation for finances and clear communication that we can provide engaging learning opportunities for our students and that we can make a difference for them. If you'd like more information about me, you can see my website, annbryan.org. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Um, my uh, very poorly done district map is up there. <laughs> Disregard the blue line and the brown line in the middle that are wrong. Uh, but if you want to look while I ask, is Chip Wallace here? Chip was said he was going to be here, but he has not come. All right. Well, Chip is also running for Zone 2, and unfortunately he is not here today. 
for zone four, um, is Michael Richter here? Did he sneak in? Michael Richter did not sneak in, okay. Well then Donna Tyner gets to speak. She only gets five minutes, she doesn't get uh, Michael's time, but she gets the full five minutes. This is Donna Tyner for zone four. You cannot get further west than the Tyner family. <laughs> Well, thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Washington uh, County Public Affairs Forum, for hosting this event today. I don't have to tell you that this year was one of the worst years in Beaverton School District history. Class size mushroomed, speech pathologists and school psychologist caseloads increased. We saw the further erosion of physical education, music, and the arts. The adopted budget of $304 million just wasn't enough to prevent layoffs and program reductions. We pray that taxpayers this year will approve the levy, but even if it's approved, it will only bring back what was lost this fiscal year. We are at the crossroads. The challenges we face call for a person with the right skill set, someone who is dedicated, energetic, and creative. Someone willing to take various approaches at the same time. I am that person. I'm Donna Tyner and I'm running for school board zone four. There are three reasons why I'm running. First, it's the next logical step in my support of my commitment to this district. As an active volunteer in the Beaverton schools for the past 15 years, I served as a classroom volunteer, team mom, and student advocate. Three years ago, I saw the need for a parent's perspective in the Student Parent Resource Handbook. I was one of the first parents asked to serve on the committee to revise the document. Now the handbook includes such information as attendance, student welfare, student services, and the rationale teachers use when disciplining a child. It's time to take that next step to serve the students and parents of this district by being on the board. Secondly, I want to find long-term school funding <coughs> solutions while maximizing current resources. In the long run, I will work with other school board members, Jeff Rose, the superintendent, Governor John Kitzhaber, and the legislature for a seamless, unified system for investing and delivering education to our students. Near term, I support the five-year levy so teaching positions and programs we recently lost can be restored. Short-term, taxpayer dollars, short-term, we must ensure that tax, as much taxpayer dollars as possible go towards class instruction. This fiscal year, we spent 59.9% of the budget on instruction. This is down from 61.6% .6 allocated last year. I want to find ways to increase the instruction budget, not reduce it further. Third, I want to involve parents, community, and businesses through existing community engagement co committees in after-school programs. The use of after-school programs is recommended by the National School Board Association. Let's leverage the expertise we have in our community for our children. Why am I qualified? I have the dedication and patience for the position. I'm approachable and a good listener. I have the ability to view situations from various angles. These are the skills I've employed over my 30 years in the insurance and risk management industry. Currently, I work for the Port of Portland as a risk analyst. I've served on the boards of a number of organizations, Willamette University Alumni Board, the State of Oregon Commission for Women, the Risk Insurance Management Society, and my Neighborhood Homeowners Association. I know how to mobilize people, get buy-in, and cooperation. I understand the power of volunteers. Lastly, I've been endorsed by Stand for Children, State Senator Mark Hass, State Representative Jeff Barker, Mayor Denny Doyle, Washington County, Dix Washington County Commissioner Dick Scouten, and the current Zone 4 school board member, Sarah Smith. Plus, parents at the following high schools, Aloha, Beaverton, Southridge, Sunset, and Westview. I ask for your vote for school board. 
I have the skills to bring us together to tackle the challenges we face. So remember, please vote for Donna Tyner, Zone 4. Thank you. is in zone five. She is running unopposed, a lucky lady. Uh, but we still need to remember to mark next to her name if you like what she says and you agree with her values and principles. Thank you for letting me be here today. My name is Leanne Larson and I'm running for zone five for the Beaverton School District. I've been married for 29 years. I have five children. They range in age from 17 to 25. All of them have gone to the Beaverton School District and my youngest is still a junior at Westview in the district. Um, the rest of them are either out of college or halfway out of college. <laughs> and we're counting our ways down till they all are done. I'm presently a general manager of a corporate housing company. It's a small business locally called US Suites and we set up corporate apartments for out-of-town companies and executives. I've been a volunteer in the Beaverton School District for 20 years. I've done everything from um, pre president and treasurer of the PTOs, I've been a classroom volunteer, an art literacy teacher, and I've served on many committees throughout the district. The last four years I've served on the Beaverton School Board. I was vice chair for one year and I've been the chair the last two years. So it's been a, a whirlwind of a four-year service. Um, while I've been on the board, we have accomplished a lot of things, but I'm just going to highlight a couple that I'm really proud of. The first one is we hired our current superintendent. I think we hired about the best superintendent we could have in the nation, and he has been a joy to work alongside. He's smart, he's um, energetic, he's a learner, and he really is here to move our district forward. Secondly, during our term, we have approved two different charter schools. One is a Spanish immersion called Arco Iris, and the other is a Mandarin Chinese immersion program. So those two options allow some um, different kinds of learning experiences for different families and things that they're learning, uh, trying to find in our district. Thirdly, it's been a difficult four years economically. Not only have we cut $150 million plus dollars out of our budget in the last five years, cut 16 school days in the last five years, and over 600 positions, but despite all that, we've still educated children and prepared them for what lies ahead after, after their high school education. We've watched kids continue to increase in their academic achievement. We haven't achieved it yet. We've still got a lot more to do, but we've been able to keep the district running despite these difficult times. If I make it back on the board the next four years, I hope, first of all, that, and this is a little bit before the election, that we pass a levy. Um, I'm spending a lot of my time trying to pass the local option levy. If we do that, we will be able to add 150 teachers back into our district, which will lower our class size, and that is one of my number one priorities. Secondly, um, we, I would like to see an increased student achievement for all students, whether they are special ed, tag or anywhere in between. My goal is to make sure that there is an agenda item on each budget or each board agenda that has something to do with student achievement. I want that to be our main focus in the next four years. I would like to see us reduce the achievement gap so that when we look at data of our students, we cannot predict their socioeconomic status or their ethnicity. Fourth, I would like to increase our communication with our community and with the parents in our district. And fifth, I'd like to see us emphasize technology. Being in a district that is surrounded by technological companies, I don't think we're doing as good of a job as we can in producing kids that are ready technologically for the competitive market that's after high school. So I'd like to see us put more of an emphasis on that. 
In conclusion, I want to say it's been an honor these past four years to work on the board. It's been challenging, I won't lie. It, um, however, has been an incredible learning opportunity for me. Every year, I feel I've become a better board member than I was the year before. And one of my greatest strengths that I bring is I am um, a person who can collaborate. I've been able to pull together seven very different-minded people and collaboratively have us work together to um, achieve some decisions that I think have been um, the best for the kids. So I look forward to the next four years and being able to serve the students and our community to make our district the best that it can be. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Now, now it's time for question and answers. Um, and the answers will come from the school board candidates. If they would all like to come up and take advantage, um, that way when a uh, question is asked, uh, you're, you're right there ready to, to pop up and, and answer. Can we lose somebody? Oh, there we go. Um, and adjust the microphone as necessary. Jim Cape, four member, question for all the candidates. The majority of the school district lives outside of Beaverton, so when the city does urban renewal and tax abatements and enterprise zones, it is diverting tax dollars from its share of school services. Some of those tax dollars are backfilled by the state school fund, which means every school district in Oregon receives less school service covering for Beaverton. So how specifically will you ensure fairness for the majority of the school district when minority Beaverton doesn't pay its share of school services? Thank you. Pardon me, I am not running for school board. Uh, what Mr. Cape is referring to is that the assessed value of the property once the uh, urban renewal district was formed and it was set by um, the assessor's office. Where's Mr. Hutzler? Is he here today? Um, anyway, uh, that office sets the baseline. Every year after that, since the um, urban renewal district was initiated in July of 2010, whenever it was, um, by state law, all taxes can go up 3% on assessed valuation. So that 3% is pulled. The baseline stays the same, so the school district gets the same amount of money they always got prior to that, but now the 3% increment falls into the urban renewal district. Now, the 3% could be more if we had a big switch in the economy, which we haven't had, that evaluations went up, but that hasn't happened yet. So what uh, Mr. Cave is talking about is the 3% um, that uh, the Beaver School District did not, has not gotten each of those three, each of that 3% in every year we've had a renewal so far. Actually, I have my note paper here. I wrote down some notes the other night. Uh, <clears throat> I've heard this issue brought up in several conversations my understanding through listening to these conversations is that tax dollars were diverted from school funding for urban renewal. I understand that thinking, the thinking behind this and the hope that backed this thinking, uh, and it, it was the hope that backed this thinking, in my opinion. Uh, I don't have clarity on why the Beaverton School District signed off on approving the use of funds for this. I feel that Urban renewal funding should not be coming out of monies that were earmarked for schools. School funding uh, faces too many uncertainties to base investing, even on a small scale, on hope. I just want to say I, I agree with Jay that uh, money should not be diverted away from schools. Um, I think that we need as many dollars as possible to go into the school district coffers and not have it diverted else, elsewhere. This 
going to say ditto. <laughs> I think that the money belongs in the school district coffers versus urban renewal. I think one of the challenges of being a school board member is that we have very limited controls over what funding uh, we are given charge over. Um, we don't, with the exception of a local option, we don't determine tax rates for anyone in our district or what amount of state funding we receive. So as a school board member, the things that we have ability to manage is one, that we're responsibly spending the money that we do have, and two, that we're working with state leaders and local leaders to make sure that we are appropriately getting the amount of funds that we need. Within Beaverton, my understanding is that the local uh, urban renewal area would have positive impacts on Beaverton. Uh, near the high school and other school areas, those funds would positively affect our schools, even though it appears as if some is being diverted away. And we would need to work with the state to make sure that we are not losing money out on that deal. And to follow up with what Ann said, um, I think as a board, we have to weigh both sides of the issues. There are benefits to the school district under urban renewal. I can even think of some different property that we're looking at for some different um, future projects that need to come in under the urban renewal boundaries. So as a board member, I will try to weigh what the benefits are versus the dollars that we may lose. and. and make a decision based on those kinds of issues. So thank you for the question. Harry Boudin, forum member. <clears throat> I read recently that the graduation rate from the Beaverton School District, and correct me if my statistic is wrong, is about 63%, 67%, which means that we have 30% plus of the students who are not graduating from high school. What can the district do about that? Or is this a combination, I'm sure, parent or involvement or lack of parent involvement. There are a whole bunch of factors, I'm sure, but what can the school district do? Well, I think a lot of it boils down to connectivity. You know, if students feel connected to their school, then they're, they're bound to excel. Partly that comes from the programs the school district offers. I mean, things, you know, connect students like music, arts, things of that nature. Extracurricular activities opportunities for, for parents to be involved in the, cl the classroom. I mean, one of the things that I'd like to do is have more parent involvement, more opportunities for parents to be involved, because that is yet another way to connect students. It's a combination of a lot of things, but those are the things that bubble up at this point in my mind that we need to do. And I think the school board can be very supportive in having those things happen. I think um, it is an alarming statistic, and it is something that um, we as a board have been thinking a lot about, um, and especially at the non-Caucasian populations, we have a higher, I think it's almost 50% for um, um, Hispanics, they do not graduate. And, and so we are trying to pull together what some of those things are, and, and Donna Tyner is corrected has to do with not only engaging students, but it's a cultural shift even in the mindset of parents, um, most who never have graduated from high school or don't even have an education past fourth or fifth grade because they had to go into the workforce. So trying to reach into beyond the school days to kind of change the, the thinking of the population. Um, we need more interventions. Kids are um, dropping out not just in their senior year, but they're dropping out as soon as they move to high school or something gets tough or they need to enter the workforce themselves. So we need to be providing counselors and intervention specialists along the way that can help kind of identify those and begin to do something to reach out and pull that, that student back in. So those are a few of the things we can do. What I have seen that I feel like has been successful is that uh, we need to make sure that every student knows that we are caring about them and looking for them. At Meadow Park Middle School, I've been really impressed to see our principal has instituted Saturday school. If you don't have your homework finished during the week, she'll be there on Saturday sitting with you, helping you, making sure that it gets finished. 
Those students know that she cares about them and that she is not about to see them fail. We need to make sure that all students know that if it's hard to get to school for attendance reasons, that we're working with you and the other social groups to make sure that we're there. We also need all students to understand the value of education that we, that we provide. We should make it clear if you get to this level of class, that means when you go to PCC or PSU, that means you'll be starting here, which is going to be saving your family money once you get there. So it, we need to be showing that we care and that we're providing value. Wow, I, I'm, I'm touched by Ann's story about the Meta Park principal um, opening up schools on Saturday to help students with their homework. I think um, we need to start early, and I know we try to do this, but with educating parents early on in elementary school as to how important education is for our students um, and getting more parents involved at that level and to continue. And I think smaller class sizes would also help keep kids engaged as long as, along with um, extracurricular activities, um, helps kids feel motivated to, to stay engaged. And of course, we need to reach out to the different cultural communities to help them feel comfortable and to ask questions and to feel part of it. Thank you. One of the things about going last is you can listen to everybody say some of the things you were thinking and a, a lot of additional information or a lot of additional lines of thought that you weren't thinking of. But I do agree uh, that uh, reaching out to families, uh, the parents of these kids. Uh, the word engaging keeps coming in, you know, engaging the families, uh, engaging the students in the classroom, having the time, the teachers having the time to engage the students, to keep them involved, to keep their direction uh, going forward in what they should be doing. Those are all very important. I don't think that there's really an answer, a one-size-fits-all answer for this. I mean, there's so many different areas you have to consider and, and use resources, use resources to pull everybody in to work as a community. Uh, my wife, like I said, teaches at Beaverton High School. Uh, they have built into their schedule uh, a period a week or a short period a week where they meet with kids that they don't teach. I think she has 20 some kids that come and meet with her and they tell her what their problems are and what they see as their future goals. And she responds to that and she provides whatever resources they need uh, to, to meet their goals. And she told the story of one sophomore that had come to her that said she was failing algebra, freshman algebra for the second time and couldn't get the help or the resources. And if she failed it the second time, then that has an effect on her, her uh, all the class uh, requirements that she needs to graduate. So I think really the resources, just, just, just find the resources uh, to help the kids and the families both. Anyway, my time's up. Karen Boland, forum member. Um, Senator Haas is on a committee and has asked me to go down to the legislature and talk about why we in Washington County want to have tax reform in the state of Oregon. So my question is, and you can be brief because it's going to be a yes or a no, would you support a consumption tax if it were dedicated to schools, public safety, those kinds of things, human resources, um, or human services, or would you only support it if, it's a, it, were, if it was just for schools? Are you with me on that? So would you support it as a consumption tax or tax reform if it was for just schools, or would you support it if it was for schools, human services, and safety? Yes, I do support tax reform. In fact, our board, it's number three on our legislative agenda, or four or five. It's somewhere up in, in there. Um, I would love it if it was dedicated only to K through 12. That would be, but... I don't think that's going to happen. So yes, I would support it as long as we have tax reform to be able to add more funds to our schools. So since you're looking for a yes or no answer, I'll be brief. And the answer is yes. Of course, dedicated to schools would be ideal. 
And that might be an easier hurdle than for everything else, but who knows? Um, if I talk to Senator Hass, I say things like, I support more money for schools, and I'm not willing to wait for tax reform to make that happen. I am supportive of looking at options for how we can increase revenue across the state and how we can get um, funding more stable across the state. <clears throat> I think we need to work carefully with voters to decide what is the best way to be get more sustainable funding for our state. I am for tax reform in this state. Um, I would support a sales tax. Um, of course, ideally, I would like for it all to go to education, but I don't think that's sustainable either. But we definitely need a sustainable form of funding for our schools and our services in this state. I will just go with the short answer and say yes. <laughs> John Hutzler, former member. Um, I think we're all uh, concerned about the shortage of funding for schools, but um, I'd be interested in your individual uh, positions. I know that the Oregon School Boards Association uh, supports significant uh, changes to the PERS program, um, but uh, every Oregon employer of public employees has um, has essentially negotiated contracts based upon the current PERS provisions. And I'm wondering whether you feel it is appropriate to, um, to seek to increase funding for schools on the backs of teachers who relied upon those negotiations and their contracts and are counting on the pensions that, that they have worked for. Well, this, of course, is a very sensitive and difficult issue. I like to say initially that I'm a public employee. I'm also a tier one person, which means that whatever happened is going to impact me. But I also look at it from the standpoint that I do not want to see additional teachers laid off. There has to be some sort of give and take. We have to maintain programs for schools because obviously I benefited from having a good quality education. I want others to benefit for a good quality education. So I would say the answer to your question is for me, I'm willing to make that sacrifice. I'm willing to make some sort of sacrifice if it means keeping teachers employed and keeping our educational system afloat. So that's my answer. I am going to agree with what you just heard. I, uh, I have 20 years in as a Tier 1 PERS recipient. Um, my wife is Tier 1 PERS. My parents are Tier 1 PERS. Her parents are Tier 1 PERS. So, you know, it, to me, I'm open as well to seeing reform. But I would like to see it. You know, PERS is a, a huge pool that it includes not only teachers, but other, other groups. To, and I think if, there, if PERS is going to be reformed, it needs to be, be reformed as a whole. There are, there are other uh, areas of interest. For me, I think I would need to see it laid out. I, I wouldn't want to say yes or no at this point without being properly educated on what they had in mind and being able to maybe foresee uh, what the outcome might be. So at this point, I, I agree that I would be very open to looking at PERS, PERS reform. Well, I have to say something positive about the Beaver, Beaver and School District. Um, they have for years um, not, and the union have agreed to this, um, not given the 6% um, that matching that so many, that is an issue with PERS. Um, and I, I'd like to see other districts and other governmental agencies also um, look at that as the matching is a big issue with PERS. But I do think we need um, to have some sort of PERS reform else we're, we're not able to, um, not only with education, but many of our services aren't going to be able to make it.
Um, as I mentioned earlier, this happens to be one of those topics that school board members don't actually have a lot of control over. These decisions are made at the state level. Um, that being said, my previous comment also agrees um, in that I would do almost anything to increase school funding for students. Um, I feel like they're our future and that um, anything that we do that takes away from them is not in our community's best interest. The current school board has one of the um, uh, number one on their legislative agenda is PERS reform. And we've tried to champion that. We've even have a superintendent who also is part of the PERS retirement system and he's out heralding that as well, um, trying to work alongside of OSBA and, and their PERS reform. I think what we're trying to look for are, are fixes that can make it through the court system and whatever we can do that's going to help make this a sustainable um, retirement system, we want to do that so that we do have the funding to keep our schools funded at the full level. So I support PERS reform. Thank you uh, very much for coming today. Uh, John Williams, uh, board member. <clears throat> we have uh, a whole bunch of families, uh, people who are unemployed, they're homeless, but Beaverton Schools has a huge number of children who go to school who are coming from homeless families who live in cars. They, you know, it's a really tough situation. Um, I'm, they're so dedicated because they still come to school. They want to learn. They want to be successful in life. And uh, they're certainly having trouble now. At Beaverton School, uh, do you know if the board has any kind of a program or anything like that to assist with those uh, homeless situations? Well, the Beaverton School District has lots of pro pro programs. There's something, oh, there's something, there's like, a, there, there are different pantries at various schools where they have food and they can provide clothing to students. Um, a lot of the counselors, for example, will uh, connect students up with different types of services in the communities. I mean, there have even been teachers I know of and counselors that have helped parents get jobs. I mean, it goes far-reaching, and there's a lot of dedicated people in this community trying to help the underprivileged and people in need of serve services. I know that um, the Beaver School District has the clothes closet, which provides um, clothing to students in the Beaver School District that have difficulty um, affording clothes. And I also know that they have a resource center located on the uh, district's um, property that helps people um, with social services issues. So I know that they have two things, but of course um, they connect with a lot of different services out there to help the homeless families. I think one of the biggest things that the district does that I've been impressed with is that uh, students who find themselves in a transient position are not forced to change schools that the school district helps facilitate them maintaining that consistent learning environment that they've already been placed in. So they're able to continue the schooling that they're done. They're not having to change schools constantly. They can be with those same teachers and support structure that are working with that student. One other thing that we've tried to do is in, in trying to increase our volunteerism, we have had some of the religious community reach out and try to connect um, once we identify these students, um, if they truly are homeless and need a place, there is some connection there where the churches might be able to provide homes or they might be able to provide clothing or food sources. So there's this connection going on and we really want to try to increase that as well, not only for homeless students but in all areas, but that's one area that we've been doing that. I'd like to thank all the candidates. Kathy's done a wonderful job. We're just. We actually are, this is actually a stage production, and so we have 58 minutes to get it done in. So the Washington County Public Affairs Forum has brought you this um, production with our school board candidates here. Kathy Sten has moderated it, and um, we can continue, and Kathy will continue to moderate after the television goes off, but essentially our primary function is informing the voters generally, so that's what we do through our television. 
Um, the Washington County Public Affairs Forum meets on Mondays uh, from 11.30 to 1. The questions are open to members only. You can become a member fairly easily. Pat Maber, our secretary, will be happy to sign you up for the remainder of the uh, term. Our last meeting is going to be the second week of uh, June, and that will be a membership meeting. That one will not be televised. We have a whole sheath of programs coming up. You can get us find us on the internet. And basically, Gary Olson's our webmaster. He's maintained it, and we're going to miss him next year when he leaves. Washington County Public Affairs Forum is hereby closing its televised portion. Anyone who has an additional um, question can, is welcome to uh, come up here and Kathy will moderate. The board's meeting afterwards, we're going to have to have that board meeting to uh, authorize certain um, things on behalf of the board, the bylaws and certain um, nominations. So thank you very much. You can ask questions, but the TV is going off. Thank you. Mike. Eric Squires, forum member. Um, I've got a yes or no question. At my doorstep on South Cooper Mountain is a forcible condemnation of property for a new high school. In this new high school, it serves an area that is bifurcated. Specifically, half of the area for the high school is outside of the jurisdiction of the high school. So I've seen a money grab between Beaverton and Hillsboro. And with the concept of sustainability being so high in the minds of the public today, why would we build a high school in an area where the local populace does not serve it? That's my question for me. My question for you is, yes or no, are you guys going to have a conversation with the elected leaders in Salem about land use as it affects the school district? Is that something you'd be willing to do is have that conversation to change scenarios like I've just described, building a high school that's not serving the immediate community? The proposed site is in the Beaverton School District and will um, serve Beaverton School students. It will require boundary changes, as does many times whenever we build a major facility in our district. It will require some boundary changes, which will be fun. And um, yes, but I'm always open to conversations about land use and that sort of thing. I'm open to that. I'm happy to have land use conversations. I do not agree with the placement of this high school as existing board members know. I find it very frustrating. I'm happy to have land use conversations and I'm actually not quite sure where the school is going to be located to answer that directly. And I'm happy to have land use conversations, but I'm also concerned by the fact that um, we don't really factor in when we're trying to put a new development in.